Hello, so I'm going to go through the second half of PowerPoint 1 now, which is really the first new material for the course, and we're going to discuss these terms free software versus open source software, and then this acronym FOS4G and what all this means. So to do this, I'm going to start by introducing this gentleman, Richard Stallman. In 1983, he conceived this free software movement based around this idea of software freedom. And around the same time, he founded the Free Software Foundation to provide the organizational structure to advance his free software ideas. And at the core of this is this concept of copyleft, which says that it's a, basically a way of structuring a software license that says anyone who redistributes the software with or without changes must pass along the freedom to further copy and change it. So copyleft essentially guarantees that every user has freedom. And the way this would work in a software license, if you have a small library of tools that you license with a copyleft license, and then another piece of software wants to use that, your library licensed this way it essentially infects the other software um, to take a negative stance on it with this copyleft license. So a software licensed this way cannot have any kind of proprietary software wrapper around it. It, it basically guarantees that this software will be free software in perpetuity. And this is opposed to this other n term you may have heard called freeware. Freeware is simply software that's available at no monetary cost. So we're talking about freedom versus monetary cost. So what is free software? Well, free, as I just alluded to, is intended to refer to the freedom to copy and reuse the software rather than the price of the software in dollars. Stallman famously said, think of it as in free speech, not as in free beer. And he came up with four kinds of freedom for the users of the software. That he, he felt these are the freedoms that software users should have with the software that they're working with. Number one, the freedom to run the program for any purpose. Number two, the freedom to study how the program works and adapt it to your needs. Number three, the freedom to redistribute copies so you can help your neighbor. And four, the freedom to improve the program and release your improvements to the public so the whole community benefits. And you'll note that number two does necessitate access to the source code. To study how the program works, you need to access the source code, even though making the source code available isn't explicitly stated in these freedoms. Then we get to this other concept behind software called open source software. And this term was coined by Eric Raymond in 1998. And he basically thought the term free would be misunderstood, which it often is, which is why I've had to go through and explain that it's free as in free speech rather than free beer. So with the open source software concept, the source code and certain other rights normally reserved for copyright holders are provided under a software license that meets the open source definition or that's in the public domain. So this license permits users to use, change, and improve the software and redistribute it in modified or unmodified forms. Sounds very similar and it's very often, this open source software is very often developed in a public collaborative manner. And Eric Raymond came up with a definition of open source that has 10 different characteristics. Free redistribution, access to source code, modification of the software and the distribution of the derived work must be allowed. The distribution of any code um, has to protect the integrity of the author's source code. There can be no discrimination against persons or groups or against fields of endeavor. And there is um, a bit about distribution of the license. The rights attached to the program must apply to all 
to whom the program is redistributed without the need for execution of an additional license by those parties. And the license must not be specific to a product, and it must not contaminate other software. So we have these two similar yet different ideas, open source software and free software. So they're different terms for software which comes with certain rights or freedoms for the end user. And that's the key. These are software licenses. And at the end of the day, both of these software license types are protecting rights of the software user. So they're similar, but they describe two approaches and philosophies towards free software. Open source and free software, or sometimes free software is called software, software libre. Both describe software which is free from any kind of onerous licensing restrictions. So in a nutshell, some say open source represents more a development methodology and free software is more of a social movement. At the end of the day, most open source software meets the definition of freedom and most free software is open source so there's access to the source code. And you can study how the program works. Because of that, most people now just use this term FOSS, free and open source software. Or for the geospatial industry, FOSS4G, free and open source software for geospatial. The term open source seems to be much more prevalent in popular culture than free software, which is why I used it in the name of the course. You'll see other terms related to this. For example, freeware, which we covered, which is software that's available at no monetary cost. But that doesn't mean you have access to the source code and can study how the program works. It just means you don't have to pay anything to get the software. There's also source available, shared source. And this is where the source code is available for viewing, but it may not be modified or redistributed, so you can study it, but you can't change it. And this has been used by Microsoft and other companies from time to time. And then there's closed source, and this would be what we would call proprietary software, such as ArcGIS, Microsoft Word, things like that. There are also other terms with this word open in them. There's open standards. And open standards are standards that are vetted in a public forum and input is available from different organizations and people. Basically, the public can comment on these standards and they get developed in an open forum. So examples of open standards would be most things related to the Internet. So HTML, for example, is an open standard. Because it's open, people can write browsers create their different browsers and every browser can interpret an HTML page and render it correctly. So um, geospatial open standards that we'll cover in the, at the end of the course are these OGC standards, WMS, WFS, and WCS. So OGC is the Open Geospatial Consortium. WMS is a web map service. WFS is a web feature service and WCS is a web coverage service. And we'll get into more of that later. So more on other terms, there's also open data. And this is data that is licensed and distributed in an open way so that people can contribute to it. So Wikipedia is kind of an example of this. And there's a, an open data set called OpenStreetMap that is essentially the Wikipedia of base maps. And we'll be talking more about that in the middle of the semester. So all of this boils down to legal concepts and licensing. So all free and open source software packages are licensed, and the license contains the terms for how that software can be used and distributed. So free and open source licenses are always focused on giving the end user rights. And there's several common FOSS licenses, GNU, GPL, BSD are common FOSS licenses. And this is contrasted now with proprietary licenses like the one for ArcGIS, which focus on restricting your use in some way. So for example, um, with a proprietary license, that license is going to restrict your use. It's going to 
limit the number of machines you can install the software on, the length of time you can install the software for, so like a calendar year, or the number of features that are available to you. So that's the difference. Proprietary software licenses are going to restrict your use and protect the company in some way, whereas open source licenses are more focused on the flip side of giving you rights to use the software as a user. So what I want to do now is compare the development cycle between these two types of software. First, starting with proprietary. With proprietary software, the objective is to maximize profits. So with ArcGIS, for example, they're a for-profit company, and they, at the end of the day, are making money by selling you software. So the next phase of the development cycle is planning and development. Um, they'll then go into beta testing, and with ArcGIS, you literally have to pay to have the privilege of being a beta tester, um, whereas with open source software, you can test it anytime you want just by using it. In the proprietary development cycle, um, it's all based on a marketing plan, and releases of the software are usually based around... Um, conferences and things like that. So sometimes the software isn't quite ready for game time, but the conference is coming up and they release it anyway. In the proprietary world, bugs are usually fixed, but they may not be prioritized the way you like. And another aspect of this is that in the proprietary world, you don't have a lot of say as to um, if there's a new feature you want. You can't really ask for that. In the proprietary world, users need good reasons to pay for upgrades. Um, so sometimes they will actually delay new features or delay fixes so that there's something new in the next version that um, is tempting for you to pay for and, and get the upgrade. Long-term maintenance contracts appear more desirable. And like I said, stable releases are time for major events and conferences. Then you have vendors, third-party vendors often selling the software. And now we'll compare this to the open source development cycle. With an open source software, the goal is always to create some stable software that solves a problem. So with QGIS, for example, they need it was a the, the problem is to create a desktop GIS that works well. And in the open source world, there's a lot less distinction between end users and software developers. So, for example, it's very difficult to actually get on the phone or email a developer at Esri and talk to them. But you could contact any of the QGIS developers, ask them questions and things like that, and most of them end up being users as well. So there's a lot more mixing um, in, in the community of open source. Since there's no monetary cost, there are no vendors that divide the developers from the users communications easier. New fixes get out quickly. If there's something that is, since the developers are usually users too, if there's a bug, um, they will usually squash it very quickly as soon as it's known, which actually puts um, the onus on the users to report bugs when they find them because the developers can't fix a bug they don't know about. If a good solution isn't reached, the project dies. So if the project ends up not being valuable, it just goes away. As long as it's useful, it'll go on. So um, in the community of an open source project, it's really um, a duocracy, meaning if there's something that needs to be done, like if you wish the documentation was better, you can contribute to it and make it better. So any skilled individual can contribute to projects in many ways. There's obviously the programming and the code development, and most of us are probably not going to be involved on that end, but we can all be involved in testing new features, reporting bugs, um, writing user manuals, translating, creating training materials, working on documentation, and things like that. So the way these open source projects operate is they're, if very small ones may be led by one individual, one programmer, which would be called a centralized 
project and they can by default make all the big decisions. Most bigger projects are operating like a democracy and there's a steering committee. So committee members might include individual developers, sole proprietors, um, or there may be companies who have developers on staff um, and then other organizations, even university organizations or municipalities and things can participate on the steering committee of an open source project if they see a value in that. So at the end of the day, free and open source versus proprietary is one better than the other. I think to most of us, the availability of the source code isn't the most important factor, but the freedom may be, and certainly the monetary cost can be as well. Um, but beyond that, I think generally speaking, FOSS software has to be evaluated in the same way as proprietary software. So with any piece of software, you have to think of, will the software meet my needs? If it's open source, we call it a project, and it, so is the project well documented? How big is the user community? How broad is the development community? Is it are there people across industry sectors, or is it kind of just focused on environmental work or something like that? Is the software modular? In other words, will it? Can you bring in data sets from other software into this software and? Will the outputs go into the next phase of a workflow? So these are the kind of things you need to ask regardless of whatever software you're using. So this slide compares open source versus proprietary software in a variety of arenas. So we have operating systems. So there's Linux on the open source side, Windows and Mac on the proprietary side. There's um, in mobile operating systems, there's Android, which is um, there's a lot of flavors of Android now, but at its core, it was an open source project versus Apple and Windows Mobile. With Office software, there's Microsoft Office on one side, Open Office on the other. Image manipulation, you can use Adobe Photoshop or GIMP. For drawings, there's Inkscape on the open source side, Adobe Illustrator on the proprietary side, and on and on and on. So th these days, there's almost always an open source equivalent to a proprietary piece of software. Even with social networks. So with Twitter, um, a lot of people have been getting upset with Twitter. So there's a, a fairly new social network called Mastodon um, that is open source. And you can set up your own instances of it and things like that. In the geospatial realm, um, we have a complete array of free and open source software. So the top section here are the desktop pieces. We're going to be working with QGIS. There's also another open source so a desktop called Map Window, another called GVSIG, Grass GIS, and UDIG. For doing work in the field, there's an open source project called QField that's related to QGIS. There are a lot of remote sensing tools in the open source world. Web mapping is really historically where the open source world has shined. And um, spatial databases as well. We're going to look a lot at Spatialite, Geo Packages, and PostGIS in this course. And those will be compared with an Esri file, Geo Database, or ArcSDE. This slide just shows you one example of a very successful open source project. So this is um, a slide that shows the use in web servers from 95 to 2011. And the blue line here is Apache, which is an open source web server. And for most of the duration of the internet, Apache is the most popular, commonly used web server. For secure environments and things like that, open source is usually valued quite, well, quite highly. So in summary, free software gives you the freedom to run, study, redistribute, share, and improve the software. Open source software at its core describes a development philosophy where the source code is made available to end users. FOSS is both a legal concept and a development philosophy then. So this first week, there's a, there's a first class exercise that you can work on today, and that will just allow me to 
get to know you better and see where you're at with GIS and what you know about open source already. This week there's also a reading assignment that will be due next Tuesday. You're going to be reading this open source approaches to spatial data handling chapter 2 PDF which will cover some of the same material I just went through so it'll reinforce some of these concepts. Um, so I want you to answer those study questions and turn those in and then uh, there'll also be a lab to work on this week as well that you can do later in the week.